The 9-11 Commission Report Chapter 10.2 Planning for War By late in the evening on September 11, the President had addressed the nation on the terrible events of the day. Vice President Cheney described the President's mood as somber. The long day was not yet over, when the large meeting that included his domestic department heads broke up. President Bush chaired a smaller meeting of top advisers, a group he would later call his War Council. This group usually included Vice President Cheney, Secretary of State Powell, Secretary of Defense Donald Rumsfeld, General Hugh Shelton, Vice Chairman of the Joint Chiefs, later to become Chairman, General Myers, DCI Tenet, Attorney General Ashcroft, and FBI Director Robert Mueller. From the White House staff, National Security Advisor Condoleezza Rice and Chief of Staff Card were part of the core group, often joined by their deputies, Stephen Hadley and Joshua Bolton. In this restricted National Security Council meeting, the President said it was a time for self-defense. The United States would punish not just the perpetrators of the attacks, but also those who harbored them. Secretary Powell said the United States had to make it clear to Pakistan, Afghanistan, and the Arab states that the time to act was now. He said he would need to build a coalition. The President noted that the attacks provided a great opportunity to engage Russia and China. Secretary Rumsfeld urged the President and the principals to think broadly about who might have harbored the attackers including Iraq, Afghanistan, Libya, Sudan, and Iran. He wondered aloud how much evidence the United States would need in order to deal with these countries, pointing out that major strikes could take up to 60 days to assemble. President Bush chaired two more meetings of the NSC on September 12. In the first meeting, he stressed that the United States was at war with a new and different kind of enemy, the President tasked principals to go beyond their pre-9-11 work and develop a strategy to eliminate terrorists and punish those who support them. As they worked on defining the goals and objectives of the upcoming campaign, they considered a paper that went beyond Al-Qaeda to propose the elimination of terrorism as a threat to our way of life, an aim that would include pursuing other international terrorist organizations in the Middle East. Rice chaired a Principals Committee meeting on September 13 in the Situation Room to refine how the fight against Al-Qaeda would be conducted. The Principals agreed that the overall message should be that anyone supporting Al-Qaeda would risk harm. The United States would need to integrate diplomacy, financial measures, intelligence, and military actions into an overarching strategy. The principles also focused on Pakistan and what it could do to turn the Taliban against al-Qaeda. They concluded that if Pakistan decided not to help the United States, it too would be at risk. The same day, Deputy Secretary of State Richard Armitage met with the Pakistani ambassador to the United States, Maliha Lodhi, and the visiting head of Pakistan's military intelligence service, Mahmoud Ahmed. Armitage said that the United States wanted Pakistan to take seven steps. To stop al-Qaeda operatives at its border and end all logistical support for bin Laden. To give the United States blanket overflight and landing rights for all necessary military and intelligence operations to provide territorial access to U.S. and Allied military intelligence and other personnel to conduct operations against al-Qaeda, to provide the United States with intelligence information, to continue to publicly condemn the terrorist acts, to cut off all shipments of fuel to the Taliban and stop recruits from going to Afghanistan, and, if the evidence implicated bin Laden and al-Qaeda, and the Taliban continued to harbor them, to break relations with the Taliban government. Pakistan made its decision swiftly. That afternoon, Secretary of State Powell announced at the beginning of an NSC meeting that Pakistani President Musharraf 
had agreed to every U.S. request for support in the war on terrorism. The next day, the U.S. Embassy in Islamabad confirmed that Musharraf and his top military commanders had agreed to all seven demands. Pakistan will need full U.S. support as it proceeds with us, the embassy noted. Musharraf said the GOP, government of Pakistan, was making substantial concessions in allowing use of its territory and that he would pay a domestic price. His standing in Pakistan was certain to suffer. To counterbalance that, he needed to show that Pakistan was benefiting from his decisions. At the September 13 NSC meeting, when Secretary Powell described Pakistan's reply, President Bush led a discussion of an appropriate ultimatum to the Taliban. He also ordered Secretary Rumsfeld to develop a military plan against the Taliban. The President wanted the United States to strike the Taliban, step back, wait to see if they got the message, and hit them hard if they did not. He made it clear that the military should focus on targets that would influence the Taliban's behavior. President Bush also tasked the State Department, which on the following day delivered to the White House a paper titled Game Plan for a Political Military Strategy for Pakistan and Afghanistan. The paper took it as a given that bin Laden would continue to act against the United States even while under Taliban control. It therefore detailed specific U.S. demands for the Taliban, surrender bin Laden and his chief lieutenants, including Ayman al-Zawahiri, tell the United States what the Taliban knew about al-Qaeda and its operations, close all terrorist camps, free all imprisoned foreigners, and comply with all U.N. Security Council resolutions. The State Department proposed delivering an ultimatum to the Taliban, produce bin Laden and his deputies, and shut down al-Qaeda camps within 24 to 48 hours, or the United States will use all necessary means to destroy the terrorist infrastructure. The State Department did not expect the Taliban to comply. Therefore, state and defense would plan to build an international coalition to go into Afghanistan. Both departments would consult with NATO and other allies and request intelligence, basing, and other support from countries according to their capabilities and resources. Finally, the plan detailed a public U.S. stance. America would use all its resources to eliminate terrorism as a threat punish those responsible for 9-11 attacks, hold states and other actors responsible for providing sanctuary to terrorists, work with a coalition to eliminate terrorist groups and networks, and avoid malice towards any people, religion, or culture. President Bush recalled that he quickly realized that the administration would have to invade Afghanistan with ground troops, but the early briefings to the President and Secretary Rumsfeld on military options were disappointing. Tommy Franks, the commanding general of Central Command, CENTCOM, told us that the President was dissatisfied. The U.S. military, Franks said, did not have an off-the-shelf plan to eliminate the Al-Qaeda threat in Afghanistan. The existing infinite resolve options did not, in his view, amount to such a plan. All these diplomatic and military plans were reviewed over the weekend of September 15 and 16 as President Bush convened his war council at Camp David. Present were Vice President Cheney, Rice, Hadley, Powell, Armitage, Rumsfeld, Ashcroft, Muller, Tenet, Deputy Secretary of Defense Paul Wolfowitz, and Kofer Black, Chief of the DCI's Counterterrorist Center. Tenet described a plan for collecting intelligence and mounting covert operations. He proposed inserting CIA teams into Afghanistan to work with Afghan warlords who would join the fight against al-Qaeda. These CIA teams would act jointly with the military special operations unit. President Bush later praised this proposal, saying it had been a turning point in his thinking. 
General Shelton briefed the principals on the preliminary plan for Afghanistan that the military had put together. It drew on the infinite resolve phased campaign plan the Pentagon had begun developing in November 2000 as an addition to the strike options it had been refining since 1998. But Shelton added a new element, the possible significant use of ground forces, and that is where President Bush reportedly focused his attention. After hearing from his senior advisors, President Bush discussed with Rice the contents of the directives he would issue to set all the plans into motion. Rice prepared a paper that President Bush then considered with principals on Monday morning, September 17. The purpose of this meeting, he recalled saying, is to assign tasks for the first wave of the war against terrorism. It starts today. In a written set of instructions, slightly refined during the morning meeting, President Bush charged Ashcroft, Mueller, and Tenet to develop a plan for homeland defense. President Bush directed Secretary of State Powell to deliver an ultimatum to the Taliban along the lines that his department had originally proposed. The State Department was also tasked to develop a plan to stabilize Pakistan and to be prepared to notify Russia and countries near Afghanistan when hostilities were imminent. In addition, Bush and his advisors discussed new legal authorities for covert action in Afghanistan, including the administration's first Memorandum of Notification on bin Laden. Shortly thereafter, President Bush authorized broad new authorities for the CIA. President Bush instructed Rumsfeld and Shelton to develop further the Camp David military plan to attack the Taliban and al-Qaeda if the Taliban rejected the ultimatum. The president also tasked Rumsfeld to ensure that robust measures to protect American military forces against terrorist attack were implemented worldwide. Finally, he directed Treasury Secretary Paul O'Neill to craft a plan to target al-Qaeda's funding and seize its assets. NSC staff members had begun leading meetings on terrorist fundraising by September 18. Also by September 18, Powell had contacted 58 of his foreign counterparts, had received offers of general aid, search and rescue equipment and personnel, and medical assistance teams. On the same day, Deputy Secretary of State Armitage was called by Mahmoud Ahmed regarding a two-day visit to Afghanistan during which the Pakistani intelligence chief had met with Mullah Omar and conveyed the U.S. demands. Omar's response was not negative on all these points, but the administration knew that the Taliban was unlikely to turn over bin Laden. The pre-9-11 draft presidential directive on al-Qaeda evolved into a new directive, National Security Presidential Directive 9, now titled, Defeating the Terrorist Threat to the United States. The directive would now extend to a global war on terrorism, not just on al-Qaeda. It also incorporated the President's determination not to distinguish between terrorists and those who harbor them. It included a determination to use military force if necessary to end al-Qaeda sanctuary in Afghanistan. The new directive, formally signed on October 25, after the fighting in Afghanistan had already begun, included new material followed by annexes discussing each targeted terrorist group. The old draft directive on al-Qaeda became, in effect, the first annex. The United States would strive to eliminate all terrorist networks, dry up their financial support, and prevent them from acquiring weapons of mass destruction. The goal was the elimination of terrorism as a threat to our way of life. End of chapter 10.2White House staff, National Security Advisor Condoleezza Rice, and Chief of Staff Card were part of the core group, often joined by their deputies, Stephen Hadley and Joshua Bolton. In this restricted National Security Council meeting, 
The President said it was a time for self-defense. Secretary of State Powell, Secretary of Defense Donald Rumsfeld, General Hugh Shelton, Vice Chairman of the Joint Chiefs, later to become Chairman, General Myers, DCI Tenet, Attorney General Ashcroft, and FBI Director Robert Mueller. From the, the United States would punish not just the perpetrators of the attacks, but also those who harbored them. Secretary Powell said the United States had to make it clear to Pakistan, Afghanistan, and the Arab states that the time to act was now. He said he would need to build the 9-11 Commission Report. Chapter 10.2 Planning for War By late in the evening on September 11, the President had addressed the nation on the terrible events of the day. Vice President Cheney described the President's mood as somber. The long day was not yet over, when the large meeting that included his domestic department heads broke up. President Bush chaired a smaller meeting of top advisors, a group he would later call his War Council. This group usually included Vice President Cheney, Secretary